Welcome to Pixel Tunes Radio, a podcast where we have fun talking about video games and Yoshi. Yeah, and video game music. <laughs> <laughs> I am the wild blue Eastern Galapagos Island Yoshi. Good. He's so fierce. Gravy. And I am T Yoshi Ed Munchakupas. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's acceptable. I don't know. I just came up with that on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mike. And I'm Ed. And this is Pixel Tunes Radio, episode 87, Yoshi. Yeah, this is our first character spotlight. We yeah. talked about it a little bit at the end of last episode. I originally came up with the idea for music from the Mushroom Kingdom, kind right. of oh, encompassing everything that like Mario had been in. And I was like, "You're insane! That'll take forever." Yeah, it's a <laughs> lot of games, but maybe for the future we can we can think about that. But I wanted to do it because I have been playing through Yoshi's Woolly World with my son Logan. And uh, so you came up with the idea of doing only Yoshi games. Yeah. And I'm like, that's cool. Yoshi's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah. He's got some really good music in a lot of his games. It's a character that not a lot of people know a lot about, but love a whole lot. So right. I felt it would be really cool to do kind of an educational spotlight on Yoshi and share some of the music in his titles. Can you do the Yoshi voice? Not at all. Really? Yeah. My voice doesn't get that high at no. all. No. It's pretty easy. You just go... No, that's wait. <coughs> that's the prepubescent uh, oh. voice cracking Yoshi. Hold on, let me see if I can do it again. Lasso. That's a little better. That's, that's not that's bad. That's a little better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, let's talk about some Yoshi facts. Facts. Yoshi, Yoshi facts, also known as Yaks. So, Yoshi's real name is T. Yoshisor Munchakupas. What's what's the T stand for? I don't Tiberius. Know. Tiberius? Tiberius, Tiberius. Yoshisor. Or Theodore. Mun- Theodore Yoshisor Munchakupas. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this was in a it was an official Nintendo guide. Okay. Somewhere. I think it was like a media guide that got put out in 1993 like for journalists and stuff for like presenting Mario and making sure that it was in line with Nintendo's continuity and so that's where they put his real name is. Uh, He's based on a Dryasaur, which is a dinosaur that lived during the late Jurassic period and I think that's what they based the model off of for the Mario Brothers movie Okay, as well. He looked much more like a dinosaur in the movie than he did. Right, You know, obviously he's a little green cute guy in the games. Who is he designed by? He's designed by Shigefumi Hino and he's a character designer and CG illustrator for lots of different Nintendo games. Uh, Super Mario World was the very first game that he worked on, and he also did design work for The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, Mario Kart 64, Yoshi's Story, and Pokemon Stadium. He was also the lead director on all three Pikmin games, and he's actually still working with Nintendo today. His last game that he just recently worked on was Mario Maker. Yeah, and that's cool, because then you know, like... You know, when you see Yoshi, it's not like somebody else's vision of Yoshi. It's right. like he's been there supervising the whole thing the whole time. He's been there the whole time. Yeah. Although, even though Shigafumi Hino designed Yoshi, he was actually created by Shigeru Miyamoto. Miyamoto had planned for Mario to have a dinosaur companion since the original Super Mario Brothers game. But the NES at the time wasn't powerful enough to combine two sprites together right. and split them up. Right. Writing on stuff wasn't wasn't really something they could do. No, especially not long term for the entire game. Yeah. Maybe like in short bursts. Exactly. But. Exactly. And they even tried to do it with Super Mario Bros. 3, but just found that they didn't have enough power to do it. So the Raccoon Frog and Tanuki suits in Mario Bros. 3 were designed instead, and those three suits kind of used the powers that they were envisioning for the Dinosaur Companion, if they had gotten him into the game. You know, now that I think about it, I mean, Adventure Island 3, which was, you know, still a kind of late release in the Nintendo's library... That game had Master Higgins riding around yeah. with different animals. It did, so. but I think it didn't have as much happening on the screen alongside True. it. Yeah, much more simplistic. So game. yeah, I think they would have had to have made Mario Brothers three a more simple game if they wanted to have right, that kind right, of right. deal going on. Yeah. So Miyamoto was finally able to implement Yoshi in Super Mario World with the capabilities of the Super Nintendo, and he was widely loved by the audiences in all three markets, and he became kind of a superstar right yeah, away. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I remember growing up playing Mario World and really loving. Yoshi. I mean, I was probably about 9 or 10 or so at the time-ish. 8, 9, 10, around that area, mm. age. 
And I, I remember really loving being able to jump on Yoshi because when, as soon as you jump on him in Super Mario World, this really awesome music uh, starts playing where you have these bongos. So it's like it, it, whatever track you're, you're hearing, the bongos kind of get added in. So you could time it really well if, if you jump on him at the, <laughs> the, at the right moment. Just moments. get him right, right where the jump fill happens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that, that was the song that brought us in. I mean, obviously that's kind of iconic music from Super right. Mario World. Mm -hmm. So that was the overworld theme with the Yoshi bongos composed by Koji Kondo. Right. And that was a really cool concept. You know, having those kind of bongos, making the song a little bit different when you jump on the dinosaur, it made it feel a little more special while you're mm -hmm. running through the world. So the guy that voices Yoshi... In the later games. In the later games is right. composer Kazumi Totaka. And he also provides the voices of Shy Guy, Professor Egad from the Luigi's Mansion series, Captain Alimar from the Pikmin series, Birdo, and K.K. Slider from Animal Crossing. And, and it's kind of well known at this point that K.K. Slider is actually based on Totaka, the, right. the little dog that plays the acoustic guitar, yeah, yeah. you know. And whenever you hear K.K. Slider doing those little vocals over his songs, that's, that's always Totaka doing his vocal stuff. Totaka's also composed on a few Yoshi games, including Yoshi Story, Yoshi Touch and Go, and he did the title theme of Yoshi's Woolly World. And he's also done sound direction, production, and supervision on Yoshi's Island DS and Yoshi's New Island on the 3DS. All right, well, let's jump into our Pixel Chat questions, which are all about Yoshi. I reached out to our Facebook group and said, hey guys, give me some questions about Yoshi. So some people did. So our first question to us comes from a friend of mine, Chris Murray. And Chris writes, why are there so many different colored Yoshis and when they mate, do their colors blend like paint? As in, would yellow and blue Yoshis make green and therefore the original Yoshis' parents would be blue and yellow? That, you know, that's a good question. I will say that in the newer Yoshi game, uh, Yoshi's Woolly World, there are all these different designs and patterns for all the different Yoshis, yeah, yeah. depending on, you know, what Jungle Yoshi, find. Forest Yoshi. Right, is. right, right. Garden Yoshi, yeah. Kamek Yoshi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can color them lots of different ways. Yeah, so that's all I can say. Yeah, uh, As far I as mean, solid colors, eh. I'll get super nerdy and just say that's not the way genetics works. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's going to be a dominant color gene and a recessive color gene. So, right, right. you know, if blue is dominant, then maybe you might get more blue Yoshis. But that's, it's kind of interesting to think about that. Why are they all different colors? And why do certain colors sometimes have different powers? Because... In some of the games, like the red Yoshi was fire and the blue Yoshi had like ice powers. Right, right. It's not, that doesn't happen so much in the no. later games. But. No, I think only really Mario World was the only game that really had that. Yeah. Um, I mean, anytime that Yoshi ate anything in later games, it, it didn't really give him powers. It was more like, you know, just to make eggs, basically. Yeah. And that, that was kind of the shtick. So, Chris, maybe that's a better question for like Bill Nye. <laughs> Bill Nye, the video game guy. Not us jamokes over at Pixel Tunes Radio. No. <laughs> so our buddy Purnell from Rhythm and Pixels asks, what has to be the deal with that Dino's Digestive track? Especially with the way he's barfing and popping eggs like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> I think he meant pooping eggs. Barfing and pooping. Nah, he meant popping. So he can pop the eggs too. No, because the eggs make a pop noise when That's they come true. out. They go pop. That's true. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. He probably has some terrible IBS. That's what knows? I was going to say, yeah. too. Yeah. It's it's pretty fast metabolism, mm -hmm. too. And how do you turn an apple into an egg? That's kind of frightening. It is. Yeah. And then you throw the eggs. Like, he's throwing his children. Didn't yeah. we talk about this at one point? Not necessarily so. from Yoshi, but probably. bosses that throw their kids <laughs> at the protagonist of the game. It's, like It's borderline horror movie. It's awful. Yes. It's awful. Yeah. Maybe the eggs are unfertilized, so at least they're not real kids <laughs> oh, yet. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Just kind of liquid, yeah. liquid-based. So, thanks, Purnell, for that lovely visual. Lovely. What's our next question? All right, so this is a non-Yoshi question. This one is from Anthony Pig. He says, Anthony Pig here with a question for y'all, maybe to actually. First, if Kenichiro Takaki of the Senran Kagura and Valkyrie Drive creators fame asked if you were a fan of life or hometown, what would y'all be? And secondly, if you had to choose one over the other, which of his game series, Senran Kagura or Valkyrie Drive, do you think has the best soundtrack? I don't really know how to answer the first question. Life or hometown? Yeah, I have no idea what he's talking I'm about. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's in reference to some of the games. I don't know. Okay. So. Well, sorry, Anthony. We can't answer you there. <laughs> <laughs> but for the second question, I'd probably say uh, Senran Kagura, just because it's one of the only ones that I've played. I haven't played Valkyrie Drive personally, but uh, 
Senran Kagura has a pretty awesome soundtrack for uh, the second one for the 3DS. We played it back on, I think one of our free picks, we played the intro music from it. I haven't really played much else. Uh, I, I played the PS4 Senran Kagura game, but it was a little too, I don't know, uh, touchy-feely for me. Yeah, so, yeah. It, it went a little too far. A little too bouncy. Yeah, no, <laughs> the, the bounce never bothers me. It's it's the uh, it's the groping that the the, uh, okay. the 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 obvious pandering and groping and and, and lollies. You know. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it's too. I don't know. Too, too far out my wheelhouse, I guess. Anyway, so if you guys want to ask <laughs> us more Pixel Tunes questions, give us a shout at pixeltunesradio at gmail.com and ask away. Or if you see us ask on our Facebook group or on Twitter, you can always respond with questions there and we will add them to our queue for the show. That's right. All so right. a lot of the picks that we picked, because we did split it up evenly as we always do, we picked 12 tracks, Ed picked six, I picked six. So a lot of the tracks that you're going to be hearing initially uh, were tracks that I picked and, you know, we'll kind of go bounce back and forth. But the first pick is from Yoshi for the NES. This came out in 1992. Uh, the music track that we're playing is Music C, Starman, and it's by Junichi Masuda. Let's give it a little Yoshi listen. Right on. Welcome back. That was Yoshi for the NES, composed in 1992. The track was Music C Starman by Junichi Masuda. Kind of a country, like twangy, very banjo feel to I, this one. I got a more classical vibe, actually, yeah. from it. Yeah. I guess you can go either way. Yeah, I mean, Junichi Masuda's claim to fame is that he's one of the designers of, um, he's a longtime game freak member. Game Freak, right. of course, yes. the developers of Pokemon. I knew that name sounded familiar. Yep. So uh, Masuda basically modeled Pokemon, the series, in an attempt to kind of like regurgitate his memories of, of summer in a place called the Hoenn region. So uh, just going and like catching fish and like bugs and stuff like that. So Neat. Yeah. yeah kind of interesting because... Cool. I never really knew where Pokemon came from, so yeah. lesson learned. <laughs> uh, regarding his career, he's mostly been with Game Freak since about 1989. His first game was Mendel Palace as the composer, and then he moved on to do Yoshi in 1991, uh, which again came out in 92 in the US. Uh, he did Mario and Wario in 93, Pulse Man for the Genesis in 94. Uh, jumping ahead, he did Pokemon Red and Blue, Yellow, Stadium, Gold and Silver, Crystal, Ruby and Sapphire, the list goes on and on. One really awesome game is Drill Dozer that he worked on in yes. 2005. He also was the producer of a game called Tembo the Badass Elephant. That's right. That yeah. came out not too long ago. That was yep. a really good game. Yeah, yeah. It was like on so, Xbox 360 and... Yeah, a bunch of series. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of game systems. So, yeah, his last game, which he's currently working on, is Giga Wrecker in 2017. He's the general producer. I'm not sure if that one's out yet. Giga Wrecker. Uh, yeah, he also did Harmonite as well. That's a really good uh, rhythm mm -hmm. music-based game. So Exactly. Yeah, he's... Uh, 
got some good stuff. Most of his uh, inspiration, one of the reasons why actually this this makes sense is uh, he draws a lot of inspiration from classical music. Two of his uh, biggest influences are Igor Stravinsky and Dmitry Shostakovich. So. Okay. Yeah. I still hear banjo. The, the song sounds kind of unique as an NES title because mm-hmm. it, it the, the the square waves have this kind of like a like a vibration to them that you yeah. don't, it's not like an arpeggio style. No, no. But it's not like a just like a sweep up or down. It's got kind of like a grit to it that you right. don't really hear too much. It's not it's games. not like Mizutani or Iwatsuki's uh, like echo feel either. It's it's something. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what exactly <laughs> it is. It's a je ne sais quoi. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I. I found out that his favorite music genre is techno. Okay. Which, I don't get techno out of any of this, but uh, I'd be interested in hearing some of his techno. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, the Pokemon songs are really bouncy. They so. are, they are. And, yeah. you know, this is a puzzle game, and you're not gonna really... I mean, later on, techno kind of became a little more popular with puzzle games, but back in the yeah. NES days, uh, especially around, like, 92, you know, things were being modeled after, like, Dr. Mario or Tetris. Those were the two big NES puzzle games out. So those tracks were a little more mid-tempo Tetris much more classical feeling while you know Dr. Mario was a little on the avant-garde um, hip Tanaka side of things but right this kind of felt I think a little bit in between the two yeah it's kind of in between like hip Tanaka's type stuff and maybe Koji Kondo yeah so do you have a lot of experience with this game? Yeah, I used to play this all the time back in the day. Um, I don't actually remember owning it or renting it. Maybe I rented it. I think I may have rented it, which is weird because normally I don't rent games over and over, but I do remember renting this one at least twice. Hmm. And it's it's a fun little puzzle game. It's basically uh, you have these falling enemies, these little blocks, and the blocks on the inside, they're like translucent blocks. On the inside, there's enemies like uh, you know piranha plants, goombas, uh, bloopers, you know, uh, booze, all sorts of different enemies. And the whole point of the game is to stack with Mario as your guy. There's four platforms, and Mario is twisting the platforms. So I don't really know how Yoshi fits in. I think the way it works is the, uh, there will be a shell, like the the bottom of a shell and the top of a shell that mm-hmm. will fall. And so the whole objective is to get the bottom of the shell underneath these enemies and then get the enemies kind of like sandwiched in between yeah and then you lay the top of the egg shell on and it crunches down and, and basically kills the enemy right and then the egg forms and yoshi pops out right and you have to gather so many yoshis per board mm-hmm. to get onto the next level yeah so, so it is multiplayer you it's can like they feel like they kind of like shoehorned yoshi into this game yeah yeah <laughs> but i mean yoshi was insanely popular back then yeah so it, it made sense for them to basically make a puzzle game with yoshi and so. it's even really interesting that they started on the snes with yoshi and then went back went back to the, to the NES. nes you know this came out a year after mario world did, yeah so i, I think they just kind of wanted to capitalize on that for the people that didn't own the SNES yet. It was still really early in the SNES's life cycle, yeah. too. I mean, these were, you know, Mario World was a launch title, so that was their first introduction to Yoshi, and there were so many people that still had an NES or Famicom, so it made sense to come out with a, a game for not only NES, but also Game Boy that, that could kind of bring people in and, you know, kind of go, hey, wait a minute, who's this dinosaur character? Oh, Yoshi, let me find out more about him. And then, you know, they went on Wikipedia, and oh, wait, no, no. <laughs> Posted on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They went on their their GeoCities Angel Fire account (laughs) and updated their status on Yoshi. On their text-based websites. Yes. So, yeah, Yoshi is a pretty fun game. It's generally relatively cheap, so if you find it, pick it up, because it's a fun little puzzle game and, you know, kind of follows in the footsteps of games like Tetris and Dr. Mario. So if you like those games, you'll like this one. It's a good time. Yeah. All right. Well... We got next Yoshi's Safari, which came out for the Super NES in 1993. The track is Hot Chocolate Cave, which sounds delicious. It does. And it's uncredited to Yoshiki Nishimura, Miyuki Uimura, and Yasushi Tokunaga. Thank you. 
And we're back. That was Yoshi's Safari, the Hot Chocolate Cave track from the SNES, released in 1993, composed by Yoshiki Nishimura, Miyuki Uemura, and Yasushi Tokunaga. That bass groove, that bass lick in Very the Very cool bass groove, yeah. definitely. And it's got that same horn sound that Nintendo uses way too often. Yeah, in my yeah, <laughs> on Super NES uh, stuff. Yeah. Pilot Wings, Super Scope, yeah. uh, or Super Scope 6, Battle Clash, all those Super Scope games tend to have this weird horn sound for some reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we did a full episode on Battle Clash and Metal Combat, but I, I, I was actually a little shocked to find out that the composers didn't work on either of those games. Mm. So to kind of tie into the composers. There were three composers that I guess were uncredited in the game itself. Yoshiki Nishimura worked on uh, Yoshi Safari in 93. That was one of his last games actually, other than Super Gold 2. His first game was the Pro Yaku in 1990, did music and sound effects. Uh, then he jumped around to Dangerous Seed in 1990, Super Tennis in 91, Marble Land in 91, Football International in 91, and Super Play Action Football in 92. So he was in like really early in the Nintendo, Super Nintendo okay. games. So and then the other composers, Miyuki Uemura, is only known for credited for Yoshi Safari and Dragon Ball Z Gaiden. That's that's pretty much it. And then Yasushi Toku Naga worked on Yoshi Safari as his final game. Dig and Spike Volleyball 92 and Yamamura Misa Suspense. Well, that explains why none of these composers sounded familiar to me because yeah. they haven't really worked on too much else besides no this and a couple other things. Not a lot. Interesting. But, yeah, I love those Super Nintendo horns. I know that you know they're it's overused, but it's it's a great it, tone. It's not yeah. like it's a grating tone that Definitely. would drive people away. No, no, and I think the track is high enough energy that it'll keep me invested and keep me keeping me want to play this game. So a little bit about this game. It's a super scope rail shooter. You were telling me during the break that one person can control Yoshi if you do two player and then the other person who's riding Yoshi plays with the super scope. Right, right. Essentially Mario is riding on Yoshi's back holding a super scope. Right. They're off to gather the 12 gems that have been stolen by the Koopa clan from jewelry land. I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah, you're saving King Fret and his son, uh, Prince Pine. Prince Pine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so the, the, it's cool because the floor is, you know, mode seven, scaling and rotating, so it looks kind of like F-Zero. You see Yoshi's head in front of you as if you're, you know, riding on his back in first person view. And then all these enemies, flying Koopas and Goombas and Kamex and spiky things all come at you and you've right. got to basically mow them down with your with your super scope. And then the end of each level, you fight one of the Koopalings and they are usually riding in a giant mech that kind of looks like they, you know, has their like big face on it or whatever. <sighs> And then those are kind of like Battle Clash style right. boss fights because they're shooting missiles at you. You got to shoot them down and get their weak point. And there's a power meter. So when you take your, your hand off of the trigger, your power meter goes up. So your blasts do so more damage. Very similar to very, Battle very Clash. Similar. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I, I kind of like because I played Battle Clash before I played Yoshi Safari. So I kind of got right into the groove. The learning curve was almost minimal for, for people that really have experience with those games so it, it's funny i i recently went back to battle clash to hang out and, and play battle clash as well as tin star so uh after you know our, our wild west episode mm. and you know get the super scope all ready to go i apparently left the batteries in and oh. left the super scope on so the super scope was dead within like five minutes and i was like <laughs> oh so I had to switch out the batteries. And that thing takes like six AA batteries. Yeah. So, woof. It does last a while as it long does. as you don't leave it turned on. Yeah. <laughs> and in the packaging, like, yeah. stowed away in I the usually just I usually just take them out and then just set them next to them. Because there is even a little bit of battery drain, even if you do turn it off right. and leave it on, you know, yeah, yeah, somewhere. Yeah. So... But Super Scope games are cool, and I really, it's one of those accessories that I just feel... It was so totally much, underused. Yeah, so much more could have been done with it. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that with the Wii remotes, we did get some, like, Super Scope-style yeah. games. You know, Nintendo kind of went back to that once the Wii came out, but I wish I had more when I was a kid. It's a shame that they never went back and made, like, a third game in the Battle Clash series. I mean, we talked about yeah, that Yeah, that would be great on the Wii. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That would fantastic. Yeah. Especially, hey, Nintendo, you're looking for dead franchises. That could have been it. But yeah. Lesson learned. Exactly. Even on the Switch with the touchscreen, it, it might work okay. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, maybe they should uh, create an adapter like they did with the GameCube uh, for the Wii U. 
and uh, make an adapter for the Super Scope yeah, <laughs> on the Switch. <laughs> Just hook up a little sensor. Yeah. Good to go. Yeah, exactly. You gotta like like duct tape the sensor. <laughs> be like sixth game cubes. Well, even Wii remotes. I mean, it would be easier probably to do Wii remotes with the Switch than it would be a Super Scope. Probably. But probably. the Super Scope is just so much more fun to hold. Yes. Oh, well. Oh, man. We so, like holding guns. Exactly. Big plastic guns. So we have a couple of Yoshi blocks in this show. Two games that Mike and I are both kind of individually fans of quite a bit that have really good soundtracks. So we're going to enter into a Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island block. And these are both picked by Mike. So what's up first? Yes. So the first track is Overworld Theme. And this game came out in 1995 on the Super NES. And it's by Koji Kondo. I've never heard of him. No, never. No. Let's find Absolutely. out more later. Yeah, sure. Be right back. Welcome back. That was Yoshi's Island, also known as Super Mario World 2. 1995 is the year of release. Super NES was the system of release. And the track was Overworld Theme by Mr. Koji Kondo. I feel like Kondo, like, called up Hip Tanaka one day and was like, dude, <laughs> you got that rage hookup. Right. Let's uh, hang out, smoke a little bit, listen to some Bob Marley, and give me some inspiration for Mario World 2. Definitely. And this is what came of that. So... This song plays during a number of different levels, but one level in particular that it plays during is a little level called 1-7, also known as Touch Fuzzy, Get, Get Dizzy. Dizzy. A very memorable level. When my buddy and I, Brian, who we had on the last episode, uh, used to hang out, we would sing goofy songs. We would make up, make up lyrics to songs that, you know, we would either create in our head or we would hear from, like, various different sources. And uh, so we created lyrics for this song as well as the follow-up song that we'll be talking about later. So the, the lyrics for this one are, uh, If you touch fuzzy, then you'll get dizzy. If you touch fuzzy, then you'll get so dizzy. If you touch fuzzy, then you'll I like it. get dizzy. That works quite and well. Then, you know, then it's like, if you touch fuzzy, then you'll get dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> you touch fuzzy, you'll get dizzy. So, like, we we would, like, bounce around, like, listening to this song and, like, coming up with these lyrics. And, like, we would just sit around and, and we would have nothing to do. We were just, like, joking around. Yeah. And this would come out of our mouths. And it's like, oh, my God. That's really funny. So silly. <laughs> yeah. So now I cannot play this game without singing in my head or either out loud with all of these various different songs. Of course, because yeah. you've probably sung the lyrics more than you've just oh, listened God, to yes. it by itself. Pretty so, much, pretty yeah. much. I feel like this is kind of where, and it's very early in, you know, Yoshi-style games, but mm -hmm. this is kind of where the template for Yoshi music, so to speak, came to play. Because yeah. this, this particular track, you hear songs that sound a lot like this with that slight kind of reggae feel to it, but very friendly sounding, very mm -hmm. bouncy. You know, you get these kind of tracks and we'll definitely hear more in this style as we go through the show. Yeah. Um, but Koji Kondo pretty much kind of established that for him, I think. Music is very bouncy, very happy, but, you know, that takes a lot of influence from a lot of more, like, urban musical Yeah, elements. yeah, it's not so jazz, much like... hip-hop, funk. Yeah. 
like Motown, like a lot of stuff like that, salsa. And, and not stuff that you heard in Super Mario World, not no. stuff that you hear in Zelda or no. any other of uh, Kondo's compositions. This feels more contemporary than a lot of the more classic video game style music stuff that he's he's done in the past. Well, even the original Mario theme, you know, the did it did it did it. I mean, that that whole track could honestly be just like either big band or uh, reggae. Yeah, more like so, a Latin yeah, style. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, clearly taking a lot of inspiration from the original Mario games. But uh, my, my favorite part about Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island is the fact that it was a big, giant middle finger from Miyamoto, who was basically, I don't know if you know about this, but... No. Um, so, Donkey Kong Country came out, and... Oh, I think you did talk about this in a Miyamoto previous episode. Miyamoto hated yeah, Donkey Kong Country. Yeah. He still probably does, <laughs> um, but... He was really upset about the fact that, you know, the game was selling so well because of graphics. And he was so, like, anti, you know, the, the fact that... It was, was focusing on the wrong things, right, in right. his opinion. His opinion was that the game should be focused on gameplay, and he didn't feel that Donkey Kong Country was the epitome of that. Which is a shame, because I really think that Rare did a fantastic job on those early Donkey Kong Country games. Mm. And so... He created Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island to be a giant middle finger to them, basically, like, to show them that graphics don't matter and that you can sell a game based on, you know, the the colorful, like... Uh, Kids like drawings. Hand, I mean, everything looked like it was drawings. done with crayon. Yeah, yeah and, and this kind of set the Yoshi franchise on the path that it's on, even to this very day, with lots of, like, childhood aspects or creation aspects in terms of creativity so you know with Yoshi's Island everything was like it had that hand-drawn like like colored pencil or like crayon look to it Yoshi's story which we'll talk about later that's another game that that kind of took that inspiration almost like claymation in a way yeah yeah uh, at sure. points and then later on uh, Yoshi's Woolly World is literally just like what was it Epic Kirby or Kirby's Epic Kirby's Yarn, Kirby's Epic Yarn yeah. right so very similar to that so that, but I, I think personally it works way better for Yoshi but yeah know, we'll no it did that. look great so yeah well we got one more um, Yoshi's Island track coming up and when we come back we'll talk a little bit more about the gameplay and stuff, so let's listen to Underground Theme from Koji Kondo. Does your child have motion control issues, sensory deprivation, and dilated pupils? How about loud, abrasive sounds during flatulation? Do they see colors and shapes? Does music sound warbled and jarring to them? If you answered yes to all these questions, I think you might be interested in hearing what I have to say. Hi, I'm Dr. John Hoskins of the Dr. Mario Emergency Virus Center. We deal in all kinds of viruses, bugs, and even addiction. The symptoms I've addressed earlier are signs that your child may have touched fuzzy and gotten dizzy. 
Fuzzy is a new drug hitting the brightest and cheeriest of places. What was once a peaceful land is now wrought with the psychedelic nightmares of being hooked on Fuzzy. Just one touch anywhere on the body can leave anyone with the previously mentioned symptoms. And despite the effects not lasting more than about 20 to 30 seconds, the hook is very real and very dangerous. Relationships can be ruined. There's risk of injuring smaller children who happen to be with you. And worst of all, the effect Fuzzy has on your motor skills can leave you susceptible to bumping into gateway enemies. All of this can leave you with a lack of motivation to obtain goals. Luckily, we here at the Dr. Mario Emergency Virus Center have employed the help of some Mushroom Kingdom prisoners who have been down a familiar path, who are willing to help. One such member of our team of hotline helpers is Mr. Larry Koopa. Say hello, Larry. Hello. Larry is currently in the middle of assisting a Yoshi who is going through withdrawals. Let's listen in. Yes, I can imagine how stressful it is because you're coming down from the fuzzy. But if you touch fuzzy, Yoshi, you're just going to go right back to where you started. Yoshi! I know, I know, it's difficult because it's staring at you, begging to be touched. But I want you to close your eyes for a minute and take a deep breath. <sighs> there you go, just breathe in and out, slowly. I want you to put four words into your mind, okay? Go for the goal. Don't think about anything else but that. There you go. That's right. If you or anyone you love has touched Fuzzy and gotten dizzy, please call the Dr. Mario Emergency Virus Center at 1-800-255-3700. That's 1-800-255-3700. And remember, we care. Welcome back. That was Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. Game came out in 1995 on the Super NES. The track was the underground theme, and that was by Koji Kondo. I have more lyrics for oh, you. Oh, lay them on me, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so this one, it goes, Look at all these kids. Look at all these kids. Working for free. Working for me, <laughs> working for free, working for me, in my mind, in my mind. Do, do, do. Okay. So it's like... So child labor. Yeah, it's basically child, child labor. Because <laughs> whenever you heard this song, it was always in the underground caves. And I don't know, Brian came up with this one. That sounds was, like a Brian thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And he just like would crack up listen, like <laughs> singing these lyrics. And there was, I think there were more lyrics to it afterwards. Like we did the whole song, like the whole thing. That's funny. But that was the only part that's still in my head that, that, that still fits. But yeah, the, the, this game is iconic. I yeah. mean, I remember when this game came out, I was in seventh grade. And I was, like, preparing for my bar mitzvah, so, like, most of the time that I was spending when I wasn't at school was, like, preparing, like, you know, reading Torah and Hebrew and everything mm -hmm. and getting prepared for that. And this game came out in 95, and... And you totally screwed up your bar mitzvah because you couldn't stop playing. No, but I remember <laughs> getting from my math teacher... I won some math award or something, which I'm terrible at math. I don't know how I won this, but... There were these fantastic colored markers, hmm. like really fine tipped colored markers. And what I would do is when I got this game, I would get, I also got the strategy guide that came with like my Nintendo Power subscription. So I would bring that into school and I would draw the Yoshis that were in the guide. Okay. And I would color them in with the different colored markers. So I would have different colored Yoshis and I would just draw like Yoshis for like hours <laughs> in school. So it probably looked a lot like the art from. Mario World 2 yeah, anyway. Yeah, true, true. That's kind of how it feels. Yeah. You know, this particular track feels more like a Nobu Uematsu track, like something from like the yeah. caves and like Final Fantasy 6. Definitely. Or the Turks theme from Final Fantasy 7. Yep, yep. You know, Koji kind of really kind of went outside the box on this he did. game. I, I think, you know, this was the first one where he kind of like 
experimented with other genres and maybe mm-hmm. he felt like he could do that maybe because he had a little more freedom or mm-hmm. you know because it was such a big game like this is one of the only games to use a super FX chip and and, and in a 2D space you know right. it was just using extra processing power it wasn't for, using it for 3D right it was using it for 2D sprites that could be stretched in a way that that was totally different. Yeah, well, that yeah. and just big color. There's animation all over the screen. Yeah. Everything was moving in some mm-hmm. sort of direction. You know, there were lots of enemies that were de- very, very detailed. And you can have like eight or something eggs following you at the same something time. Like so it yeah. was, it, there was a lot of extra stuff on there that the Super Nintendo wouldn't be able to handle by itself, you know, pretty normally. So unfortunately, that I guess that's kind of like... Uh, Miyamoto's caveat is that okay we can do a game like this but it requires extra processing power right. it's like maybe you didn't exactly beat Rare because they kind of did a game that looked really good without the Super FX chip but at the same time it caused him to make a game that was a lot of fun and it was a really cool adventure yeah so I had really fond memories of playing this game for hours and hours and I remember one of the really cool things about this game is that when you beat a level, it gives you a score. So you've got like, I think it's like eight worlds or something like that, or seven, eight worlds. And when you beat the level, it flips this card over, almost like a chalkboard type thing. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a score. And the score is based out of 100. And it depends on how many stars you get, like these little like star type things. daisies. Yeah, daisies and red coins. Right. Right. There's 20 of those. 20 of those, right. So you've got to collect all this stuff throughout the level. And if you don't collect all this stuff, then you've got to go back through and play the game. But what's really cool about this is it not only rewards you with completionary sense, but it also unlocks a level if you do it for the entire world. Right. So if you do like levels one through, I don't know, 10 or 9 or whatever, then you get an extra level at the end, which is really, really cool. Yeah, and they they continue that tradition all the way up to Yoshi's Woolly World, too. Same concept for that. Yeah, and these games, I always felt, were much harder than games like Kirby. Because Kirby and Yoshi are very similar. They both eat their enemies and digest them. They don't, you know, (laughs) Kirby doesn't poop out eggs, but I... (laughs) still always kind of had this weird connection between Kirby and Yoshi. I always kind of felt like they were a very similar breed of characters. Yeah, I kind of agree. I mean, they're both kind of made for the younger crowd. They're both very pastel, you know, Mm -hmm. bright bright green, bright pink. Yeah. And so I I can definitely see those similarities. But I I always felt like the Kirby games were like for little kids and the Yoshi games were for like the hardcore gamers. Yeah, yeah. Because these games are hard. Even up until Yoshi's Whirly World, these games are, are pretty difficult. Yeah, they do get pretty hard. But... Yeah, so one of the cool things about this is that you're also carrying around Baby Mario in Yoshi's Island. And I guess basically it's like a prequel to all the Mario games where Yoshi is essentially taking care of Baby Mario. The plot is that Baby Luigi gets kidnapped by Kamek, the uh, Magic Koopa. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about Kamek in these Yoshi games is that he always calls Yoshi, not Yoshi, but he calls him Yoshi Baby. I don't know why, (laughs) but like... I always felt that was, like, charming. Or, like, it, it was like, he, he was like this weird Italian, like, wizard. He was like, <laughs> Yoshi hey, baby. Yoshi baby, yeah? You know? How so. you doing? How you doing? Maybe that's why I wanted Luigi. Maybe there was some family history there. Maybe, I don't maybe. know. Can you make his Mario and Luigi's dad? Oh, God. Oh, boy. So, that would explain yeah. a lot, actually. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there were a lot of Yoshi games that came out after this, but they didn't come out for a couple years. So why don't we, before we jump into the next like Yoshi game, why don't we talk a little bit about our next game? Yeah, next game is Mario Party, and this is where Yoshi kind of started to become a character that was in the Mushroom Kingdom along with everyone else, appearing in games that weren't necessarily just focused on him. Right, So like Mario is, Kart. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, especially on the N64, Mario Kart and Mario Party were two games he was kind of like a supporting character for. Definitely. Uh, this came out in 1998 on the N64. This is the theme song to Yoshi's Tropical Island Board, composed by Yasunori Mitsuda.
yeah, man, I feel like I'm back on the beach. Hey, pass me that ganja, man. <laughs> that was Yoshi's Tropical Island Board from the game Mario Party, released in 1998 on the N64, composed by Yasunori Mitsuda. And, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of N64 music on the show. We had a whole show dedicated to the N64. I feel like these are maybe some of the most high-quality samples uh, and instruments that I've heard so far from the N64 on Pixel Tunes. Yeah, Just, very this, clear. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. I didn't even realize it was from an N64 game the first time I heard it, just mm. as in, like, a, a, a bunch of random YouTube soundtrack videos that I was listening to. Right. And uh, just, you know, those horn samples, and then it goes into those steel drums, and then there's, like, that percussion solo at the end. It goes through all these cool little parts. It's got a very, very happy, bouncy, feely to it. Bouncy feely. Bouncy feely. Bouncy feely to it. Bouncy feely. Touch feely, get dizzy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, no, it's, I mean, it's just a lot of fun with the little whistles, and yeah. they do a really nice job kind of bringing that atmosphere out. They do a really good job with Latin elements here, like a lot of the, like, horn a- atmosphere that you get. Also with the, as you mentioned, the whistle. Steel drums. Yeah, the steel stuff. drums, the whistles. Like, all of that sounds really good. And it, it's all, it kind of gives this interesting vibe to the track that it's not quite Latin, it's not quite reggae, it's just fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. This would be a great, this whole episode would be a great, like, summer, like, a good summer episode, Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it is coming out right at the beginning of spring, getting into summer, so it's great for, you know, nice days driving with the windows open, blasting some Yoshi tunes. Yeah, man. It's not exactly what I would think (laughs) of, but it works out. So let's talk a little bit about Yasunori Mitsuda. I mean, we've we've covered him on the show before. Obviously, most famous for composing the Chrono Trigger series, but uh, he started in 1990, spent a few years at Wolf Team mostly doing sound effects before joining Square in 1992. While there, he did some more sound effects for Final Fantasy V, The Seventh Saga, uh, Secret of Mana, and Romancing Saga 2. He composed two games for Square, Chrono Trigger, which he co-composed with Nobuo Uematsu, and Front Mission Gun Hazard. You saying Chrono Trigger? I say chrono. You say chrono? I say chrono. That's weird. Chronology. Chrono. Chronological. Chrono. Chrono trigger. I mean, but but that's that's not how it's pronounced in English, No, his name is chrono, though. His name is chrono. No, it's not. It's chrono. It's C-R-O-N-O. Prove it. Okay. (laughs) It's right here on Wikipedia. And wiki. Well, it's Wikipedia. That doesn't mean it's true. Listen. Anybody can... I will, I will go to my shelf, grab my Chrono Trigger box, pull out the manual, and show you that his name is C-R-O-N-O. Oh, I know how it looks. Right, but the game is based on his name. It's not necessarily based on cr- chrono, cr- like chronological. Right, but I know, his, and I know but his name nobody's... is based on the word chronological. This is hard corpse all over again. <laughs> <sighs> we need some proof. We need somebody. We need a video. If anybody can provide on, on our Facebook group a video from somebody from Square right. talking about the game and uh, pronouncing it Chrono or Chrono, I need. We need to see this. We need this. This because now yeah. we're gonna we're gonna come to blows. It doesn't over matter. This. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's Chrono. Yeah, and I'm gonna say it's Chrono. So yeah, yeah but you're wrong. Just, so. You know, if I'm wrong, I'll I'll change my pronunciation. <laughs> I'll be the bigger man here. Uh, anyhow, so getting back on track, after he left Square in 1996. Uh, He took some time off and then formed his own company, Procyon Studios, in 2001. While he was there, he worked on the first two Mario Party games, Arc Rise Fantasia, Kid Icarus Uprising, the Luminous Arc series, and the Inazuma Eleven series. And he took on a whole bunch of roles like composition, arrangement, sound director, and sound producer. And then most recently, he composed the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 title for the Wii U. Uh, Well, that's Xenoblade Chronicles X. Xeno. Xenoblade. Xeno. Xenoblade. Xenoblade. It's Xenoblade. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is actually not out yet. So okay. that is the one for the Switch that's coming out. Xenoblade Chronicles X, I believe, was Yoko Shimomura. Okay. So maybe when Chronicles 2 comes out, he will be the composer. Right. On He'll that be the composer. Game. Right. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, he basically almost killed himself with Chrono Trigger. So right. Literally. Yeah. Ended up in the hospital from overworked, over exhaustion. So. You know, takes takes a lot for something like that to happen with somebody. So, you know, that's when Nobuo Uematsu had to step in and work on some of the tracks to help him out. But exactly. I, I kind of feel like Square gave him a shot at it for doing sound effects for them for so long with, you know, Final Fantasy V, Seven Saga, Secret of Mana, etc. 
And they were kind of like, hey, this guy's pretty good. Let's give him a shot at composition. So this was like his big shot. So I, I, yeah. I would imagine a lot was riding on that, too. Oh, yeah. And he put out some quality work, too. So yeah. you can't really argue with that. But, Definitely. you know, maybe he learned to calm down a little bit. Maybe he did start with <laughs> he a did. little bit of ganja. And that's, that was the inspiration yeah, yeah. for this particular track. He, Who he, knows? He didn't calm down by playing Mario Party because nobody is calm when they play yeah. Mario Party. I can just imagine his like, office space where he gets hypnotized and all of a sudden he's <laughs> like, hey, man. I don't really care about anything. Let's just compose some some cool music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, have you like played Mario Party a lot or I uh, yeah. I mean not the original Mario Party so okay. much, but it has it was a staple in like with my friends when like Eddie was super little, so like ten years ago or whatever. I think I started with Mario Party eight. Oh really? On the GameCube. Oh wow. No, maybe not eight, maybe it was seven. Okay, it was a title that came with the microphone. That was six. Okay, that was so GameCube. I started with six. So And I've been playing everyone since then. Okay. So my little brother is a huge Mario Party fan. Cool. Huge. It's like one of his favorite series. He's not a big gamer at all, mm. but he loves Mario Party. So I've been playing Mario Party games since the first one. Wow. And, you know, I, I used to play with him pretty frequently, and, you know, he always wanted to play. And, like, <laughs> it'd, be the, it'd be at the point where I was like, dude, I don't want to play. And yeah. He'd be like, yeah. Ooh, play. So we used to play it quite uh, quite often. He would get mad when he when he lost. Yeah. See, I got Eddie into it for a bit, and but he only wanted to play one board on Mario Party 8. Mm-hmm. But then I got Logan into it, and now he wants to play, and he, he likes to play all the different ones. Right. So. And N64 was never really big in my house, so yeah. we didn't have any of the N64 Mario parties. So oh, just, okay. When it came out of the GameCube is when we started really getting into the series so with the game the way it works is it's a board game pretty much where you're moving these mario characters around the screen and then usually if, there's some sort of storyline behind the whole thing yeah too. it's always really flaky bowser like, gets mad because you know, he's not invited to a party or something bowser ate too much ice cream and now mario's gotta save him or something <laughs> like that i don't know but <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense <laughs> <laughs> but it could totally be a plot of a Mario Party game. God. Anyways, Mario Party, yeah, you're going around the board and playing this game, and then you'll get to a point where you have to do these mini games that are kind of like spread throughout the thing, and you're doing this to compete for stars. Right. So the the thing that always pissed me off about Mario Party is that you could be in the top spot. You could have the most stars. Yeah. And something will happen during the end of the game and then all of a sudden Luigi's the winner. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter who is playing as Luigi. He was almost always the winner. That's funny. And I'm like, yo, this is garbage. We didn't have that experience too much. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot. It's like there's a lot of luck but there's also a lot of skill. Like, if right. you win a lot of the mini games, you have a much better chance of winning although yeah. there is a chance that, you know, there might be something because... I think that later on they added the ability to turn those bonus stars on and off that right. are awarded at the end of the game. Yeah, that, those were which like those were hot. Garbage. Whoever moved the most spaces or used was, the most special like items. Whoever or, had the best hair. Yeah. Or like you know whoever like flossed the most. Yeah, a lot like, of it was stuff that you couldn't control. It was just the yeah. roll of the dice. You yeah. know would, would determine whether or not you got these stars or not. So. Whoever was the color purple won yeah. a star. The like, purple star. Yeah, yeah. So, so but cool. Mario Party is a fantastic series. Yeah, um, they're good games. The latest one, Mario Party Ten, is a lot of fun too because it does use the game pad. It's on the Wii U. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, some mini that games one. are, it's got a lot of extra stuff. And then there's Wii Party U as well, which is kind of like a spin off of the Mario okay. Party series using the Mii characters, and that's fun. The so. last one I really, really liked was four. I liked the mm. first one, I liked four. All the others, I was kind of like, meh. I don't know. I gotta check out the N64 ones because I've never. I, I have a feeling I probably won't like them as much just because I know what they're capable of on the yeah. next gen system. The first one is really fun. The yeah. first one and the fourth one have the best mini games in my opinion. Okay. I thought that's when they did they did the best. I'll check them out. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to our next title. This is another N64 game. This is Yoshi Story, and this came out in 1998. And the track is Yo Yo Yoshi by Kazumi Totaka. You, 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 you,
Oh man, that was Yo Yo Yoshi from Yoshi's Story for the N64 in 1998. Remix! Composed by Kazumi Totaka. Yoshi. Yeah, Totaka is one of the most experimental composers over at Nintendo. And uh, he just, he loves to turn in like really bizarre kind of crazy music. This is not the first time he's he's went with rap. He also did that on Luigi's Mansion too. Yeah. And some stuff. old like Game Boy throwback music in yep. there and stuff. So, and you can tell this is, this is Totaka's voice doing the voice samples as well. Because if you speed it up, it kind of sounds like Professor Egad from yes. the... From the Luigi's Mansion games, so. So, interestingly enough, we talked a little bit about Nobuo Uematsu just a few minutes ago with the previous track. This track sounds a lot like the track that you picked, uh, the Dynamic Tracer uh, track. Oh, that acapella track? Yeah, for our episode 76, which was the voiceover or vocal track episode that we did. So, if you like that, then you'll probably like this as well. But yeah, this definitely has more of a hip-hop vibe to it. I love how... Interesting the way that the percussion worked out where like he changed up the bass and the snare pretty frequently so that it didn't sound repetitive. It it still sounded fresh yeah. throughout the entire track. Even though you have those funny little vocal samples going on, I think that's kind of like the focus of the song. But the, the backing beat was really cool. It, I think he used the kind of like the static of the low quality samples. Almost made it sound like the loops were coming off of a vinyl record or something like that. Right, it sounded right. really cool. So, have you played Yoshi's Story? I have never played Yoshi's Story. Okay. Yoshi's Story is the first import game I ever played. The reason I say that is because a buddy of mine, Paul, who does all my intros for Dude, You Haven't Played This Game. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, he and I went to high school together. And so one day he was like, hey, I've got, I know you're, uh, you've got an N64 and, you know, we were in high school and he was like, uh, do you want a import adapter for the N64? And I was like, sure, I guess. Sure. Why not? And he was like, yeah, I'll give you Yoshi's story too. And I think he charged me like five bucks for the whole thing. Nice. In the day, which was cool. So... I start playing the game, and I had no clue what was going on. <laughs> like, I, for whatever reason in my head, didn't think of it, think it through, and realize that, oh, wait a minute, there was going to be a bunch of Japanese. Yeah. And so there was. This was the import copy of Yoshi's Story. So I haven't gone back and played Yoshi's Story since then. I don't know what happened to the copy of the cartridge that he gave me. But it, the, just casually dropped it off the side of the car. Yeah, right. on the highway. I don't know. I just wasn't really feeling Yoshi's story for whatever reason. It was too cartoony for me, and it. I don't know. I mean, that was at that point in 1998. I was playing PlayStation quite a bit too. So even though I was playing, you know, and uh, like I was playing N64 stuff, I was also playing mostly PlayStation, hmm. and I was jumping on the games like Resident Evil and Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and you know, yeah. like more, much more adult, much more like teenage and mature serious games uh, that had a lot more, you know, blood and sexual content and all that type of stuff. Yeah. And to jump back down to Yoshi's story, I think at that time, I don't know what it was, but I just wasn't in the mood to play it. It also um, didn't get very good reviews. I mean, most critics rated it like a, between a 5 and a 7. Yeah. So yeah. it was an average game, but so nothing that was really wasn't, that fancy. It wasn't just me. Yeah. yeah. But it has like a pop-up storybook feel to it where like a, uh, you'll have these pages that turn and things like that and like things will pop up. But because it was all in Japanese, I couldn't figure out what to do at points. Mm. I think I only got like maybe two or three levels in. But one really creepy thing that I thought was weird is when you beat... I beat this level, and you would hear, from what I understand, it's probably Totaka's voice, and it sounds like he's singing a song. It's like it's like a chorus of Yoshi's, and it sounds like they're saying, Me Purple. <laughs> so they're singing, like, Me Purple, and I couldn't tell if that was Japanese oh, or... Oh, I've heard that song. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 I don't know. I think they're just nonsense. Yeah. I don't think Yoshi says anything really real except for his no. name. I could be wrong, but... I've never wrong. been able to pick out <laughs> anything that sounds like a Japanese, you know, the, their, 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 their phonetics or anything like that. Right. Yeah, it was it was weird. So, But it was cool to hear, like, the voice of Yoshi beyond just, you know, like, Yoshi, you know, to hear, like, other vocal effects. I yeah. thought that was kind of neat. But, yeah, I, I just couldn't get into this game. But uh, the music is great. You know, it's all awesome Tataka stuff. You know, lots of, lots of really great range, so... Good cool. Stuff. Yeah. I'll have to try it out one day. Yeah. It's worth it's worth 
playing to try out, but I wouldn't, you know, really put that much time and effort into it. I mean, like, other Yoshi games are way better, so. Speaking of a game worth trying, but probably not worth playing all the way through, <laughs> our next title is Yoshi Topsy Turvy. Uh, this came out on the Game Boy in 2004. This is Tale of the Spirit of Kindness by Tatsuyuki Maeda, Masaru Setsumoto, and Mariko Nanba. And we're back. That was Tale of the Spirit of Kindness from Yoshi Topsy Turvy, which came out on the Game Boy Advance in 2004, composed by Tatsuyuki Maeda, Masaru Setsumaru, and Mariko Nanba. And uh, again, more reggae, more tropical feels. Uh, we're getting I love that. The, the vocal, like a hoo, 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 like the, <laughs> yeah. that stuff. There was a little bit of that in the Mario Party Right, in the Mario Party track, track. too. Yep. Yeah. I was just going to say. But they're just fun, feel-good, summery songs. And, you know, it's funny because, and I forgot to mention it last break, but, you know, you, you get these kinds of tracks, like 90% of Yoshi's songs feel like this. Very yeah. upward and bouncy. But then every once in a while in, like, you know, Yoshi's Story or uh, Super Mario World 2, you get, like, one track that's, like, completely different Like uh, than the Child else. Slave Labor Camp. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit different. Maze, but didn't, yeah. like, the boss in that game, wasn't that, like, a pure, like, guitar rock track? It just sounded yes. very, very different from, yeah. from the rest of the soundtrack. That so, is true. You know, once in a while with Yoshi songs, you get, like, they throw you a curveball with the soundtrack every once in a while. And yeah. it's, it's just, it's fun stuff. Yeah, I remember that track, actually, from Yoshi's Island, now that you mentioned it. I should have picked that. It, it sounds like something Tim Fallon would do. Yeah, it's, like, real awesome, sure. like, for prog sure. rock. But anyways, uh, Yoshi Topsy Turvy was this uh, side-scrolling platformer that had a gyroscope in the Game Boy Advance cartridge. It was like and, a green cart, if I remember. Yeah, recall. and so while you're playing the game, you could tilt your Game Boy Advance back and forth to tilt the level back and forth, and Yoshi would kind of, you know, lean forward or backward depending on which way you're tilting it, and it would help him get through levels. You know, he'd come to a, a, a wall that goes straight up at 90 degrees, but if you tilt your Game Boy Advance far enough, it'll become a ramp, and then he can walk right. up the ramp without having to worry about it. Or as he's falling, you can tilt back and forth to control his fall, etc., etc. Unfortunately, this is <clears throat> not compatible with the Game Boy Player. Can you imagine, like, putting this in, like, <laughs> rotating your GameCube? <laughs> Especially since it comes controller. out the front, you'd have to, like, yeah, you'd have yeah. to hold it up Word, yeah. and then tilt it back and forth. <laughs> Holy cow. That'd be hilarious. I played this on an emulator just to try it out. The emulator had the ability to, it had like functions where you could emulate the tilting motion. Oh, cool. But I, I so I said I was using a PS3 controller and I said it's one of the analog controls. And so I was able to tilt and go back and forth, but it was really hard to do trying to jump and, and move with one stick and mm. use the other analog stick at the same time. So uh, I, I didn't get too far through it. I found it really basic. Uh, it was just kind of like you're just walking through the animation wasn't that great mm. even the tilting motion even though it was an analog stick like it didn't it felt like there was only like two degrees of tilt either mm. way like it wasn't true analog right like, like a Wii remote would be yeah yeah I, I was kind of left with a sour taste in my mouth over the whole thing that's what so, she said yeah <laughs> Yoshi licked the wrong egg oh boy <laughs> too much too much fuzzy yeah. Yoshi's Universal Gravitation is the name in, I believe, Japan. Japan and Europe, I think. Yeah. Universal Gravitation. Right. And uh, I think that's a better 
explanation, uh, at least on the, on the advertising level, than Yoshi Topsy Turvy. Yeah, but I think Universal Gravitation also sounds more like a adult game, not true. like a you know X-rated game, but you know just more for grown-up audiences. Right. Where Topsy Turvy is kind of a more kid-friendly. Yeah. So maybe that's the demographic they were going that's for true. in the U.S. That, that makes sense. You know, back then. Nintendo was really hammering home the the ideals of innovation with their games and so a lot of games were coming out back then where you know you would have things like gyroscopes in it vibration like with the Game Boy Color pinball games uh, yeah. that would come out like or Perfect Dark Top Speed Rally I think was another one those types of games where something was affecting the performance of the game in a different way beyond just simple gameplay so you know this was one of the experiments that they took and you know probably didn't do so well at least sales wise i can't imagine that it would that it would do very well review wise a lot of people said it wasn't that great unfortunately yeah it got like a d plus from yeah. oneup.com uh, you know 61 percent on game rankings the, so. the problem that you have when you go with a gimmick is that unless you know how to hone that gimmick into a full-bodied like variety in terms of gameplay, mm-hmm. you're basically just doing that one thing over and over again, and yeah. that's your shtick. And that's just not going to work when it comes to video games. Yeah. That's why video games aren't where they were back in the late 70s, where it was just, you know, hey, dude running around a maze eating ghosts. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, I mean, there were a lot of gimmicks back then, too, because every game was a clone of itself. But, right. But a lot of those gimmicks didn't work, which is why games became very Run in the same. Middle. You know, you True. controlled them all the same way. That just seems to be what works best. Yeah. Uh, ironically, even though this was a Nintendo-style innovation for Topsy Turvy with the motion controls, mm-hmm. the game was actually developed by Artoon, which were made up of Sega developers right. and composers. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the composers because of that. Tatsuyuki Mieda was a Japanese composer and sound designer uh, working for Sega, who was best known for composing some of the music for Sonic the Hedgehog 3, Sonic and Knuckles, Dragon Force, and Sonic 3D Blast. He also worked on Sonic Advance 2 and 3, Yakuza 3 and 4, and both Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games titles, the 2012 and 2014 iterations. Masaru Setsumaru, same deal, um, you know, was a sound designer and composer for Sega. Um, went Also went by the alias Bossa Nova Oiz, I guess you pronounce it, O-Y-Z. Okay. We'll go with that. Uh, he worked on Sonic Jam, Burning Rangers, uh, the Shinobi game for the PS2, which had a really good soundtrack, Nightshade, and Puyo Puyo 7, and then did sound effects for stuff like the Yakuza and the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games series. And then Mariko Nanba, our third composer, she was best known for scoring many of the Sonic the Hedgehog games as well as her work on Panzer Dragoon Saga. And she worked for Sega from 94 to 2010. Uh, she worked on Knuckles Chaotix, Blinks the Time Sweeper, Super Monkey Ball Step and Roll, and uh, her last game was Sonic Colors in 2010. Hmm. So it's funny I got getting all these composers that are yeah, like yeah. so ensconced in the Sega universe, and here they are working on a Yoshi game together. <laughs> and uh, you know, funny uh, how the tables have turned. Yeah, but even this music sounds very Yoshi. So they, yeah. you know, they were able to capture that feel, even though they were mostly going for the you know the Sega titles before and after this. My big problem with this track is some of the notes hang too much. There's too much sustain. Yeah, I and think it's, that's it's, more like the Game Boy Advance sound emulation. That could be. I, they sound a lot better when you're actually playing it. It's more okay. of a limitation of how computers interpret the Game Boy right. Advance music. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Don't hold it against them. All right, I'll try. <laughs> Next up, speaking of handhelds, we've got another Yoshi's game that came out on a handheld, Yoshi's Island DS. This was actually technically the first true sequel to Yoshi's Island in the sense that it followed the same type of gameplay and look other than Yoshi's Story. Yoshi's Story, personally, I don't really count as an official sequel. Ooh, Yoshi's Story. Yeah, I don't know. But Yoshi's Island DS followed it a little bit closer. So this game came out in 2006. This is Big Boss theme. It has nothing to do with Metal Gear, I promise. <laughs> and it's by Yutaka Minobe and Masayoshi Ishii. Thank you. 
Welcome back to our Yoshi Spectacle. That was Yoshi's <laughs> Island DS, and that came out in 2006 on Nintendo DS. The track is called Big Boss Theme, and I told you it had nothing to do with Big Boss from Metal Gear. <laughs> Yutaka Minobe and Masayoshi Ishii were the composers. It's kind of funny that uh, one of the composers' name has the word Yoshi in it. That's kind of funny. <laughs> Not an uncommon uh, combination oh, of sure. sounds in yes. Japanese language. Yes, yes. One thing that really stands out to me audibly is the accordion sounds that you that you get. The na 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 Yeah, I felt very much like the Super Mario World haunted mansion okay. theme in that like accordion part right there. Okay. Kind of feels a little spooky. I was actually gonna say spooky, but it's not <laughs> not the appropriate time. Not in the middle of summer. No, not in the middle of summer. <laughs> So, yeah, I was going to say Castlevania, actually. Yeah. Like Castlevania or an RPG song. Yeah. 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 So that, that's what it kind of reminded me of. A little bit of classical stuff. I really like that very thick bass. Dun, yeah. dun, 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 it's almost dun. like palm muted in a way. Yeah. It's, it's good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. So Yutaka Minobe worked a lot with Nintendo as well as some other third parties. Worked with Sega a lot. Started off with Sega in 1998 with Sonic Adventure doing sound effects. Jumped over to a couple other games that uh, came out for the Dreamcast like Skies of Arcadia in 2000, worked on the music and sound effects. Later jumped ship and uh, after doing some Sonic Advance games and Shinobi, Panzer Dragon Orta, and after the after a couple other Sonic games, uh, ended up coming out with Nier in 2010. Okay. And uh, you know, did a bunch of Sonic stuff. Uh, actually did Odama for in 2006, which was like a GameCube late release. Speaking uh, of the GameCube microphone. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you use that to as like a pinball thing. Talk to, to your balls. Right. Talk to your balls. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fling Smash in 2010 did music composition on that. Echo Shift was the composer. And then uh, Sonic Generations uh, did a bunch of remixes for that. And uh, then pretty much just did the Mario and Sonic games for the Olympic Games. Uh, for the winter ones and the uh, you know the Sonic and Rio, so cool stuff. Cool. And then Masayoshi Ishii also kind of jumped around to a bunch of different Sega games as well as some PlayStation stuff like Evil Zone in 1999, uh, which was a relatively obscure fighter. Uh, Tempo in 95, F1 Challenge, Ronde in 97, Devil Kings in 2005, uh, Blood Will Tell, which is a really cool PS2 game, uh, did the music with uh, Tease Music, right. uh, that group. And then uh, later on did Devil May Cry 4, again with Tease Music, Bomberman Story DS, Cooking Mama, and Cooking Mama Cook-Off. His latest game was Mario Party Star Rush in 2016. He was the music director on that. Yeah, I haven't played this one. I've heard it's very much basically Yoshi's Island 2, Okay. officially or unofficially officially if you want so new levels but staying same kind of style right, game, right 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 and yeah, same that, that's, visual style it's kind of like um you know since that first yoshi game on the super nintendo yoshi's always had this play style where he'll gather these eggs behind him and then you would hit or hold a button depending on your control scheme and you would get like a target a target right. reticle yeah and would go back and forth and then that would aim where you're going to throw the egg and mm -hmm. it would you know then yoshi would throw it so this kind of continues that and i think with the, the stylus on the ds they tried something different yeah 
uh, where you can aim where you're throwing using the stylus. I don't know how well it works. I haven't played this game myself yeah, either. I'll have to give it a shot. This game looks fantastic though, and uh, it continues with the whole Baby Mario thing, except you're not only picking up Baby Mario, but also Baby Peach, Baby Donkey Kong, Baby Wario. Oh boy. And also uh, you're you're able to control Baby Bowser too. The so. whole Baby Mushroom Kingdom. The, the whole Baby Mushroom Kingdom. You know, uh, Nintendo had this fascination with making baby versions of uh, all their characters like Baby Mario, Baby Luigi, etc. Right. Et this is around the time Mario Kart Double Dash came out too, and this right. had the baby characters in it yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, unfortunately. I'm not a big fan of the baby characters. I, I think it's mostly due to my frustration at trying to gather baby Mario whenever I got hit in <laughs> Yoshi's story. <laughs> oh, <laughs> brutal. Yeah. That 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 baby crying is, is absolutely horrendous. It's the equivalent of like Samus running out of health. Yes. And the beeping just following you into your dreams. Yes. It's making me not look forward to potentially being a father in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, this this game's pretty, from what I understand, it's, it's visually very captivating, just like uh, Yoshi's Island. So if you're looking for a more traditional Yoshi game that doesn't, you know, kind of go with, you know, the game play that we talked about before with uh, Universal Gravitation or Topsy Turvy, then yeah, I'd probably recommend Yoshi's Island 2 or Yoshi's Island DS. Cool. So, speaking of both Masa Yoshi Ishii and Yoshi's Island, our next track is Yoshi's New Island, which came out on the 3DS in 2014. This one is Bandit Valley, composed by Masa Yoshi Ishii. Alright, that was Bandit Valley from Yoshi's New Island, which came out on the 3DS in 2014 by composer Masayoshi 
Ishii. I do like this one because it's a little less bubbly and cutesy, but mm -hmm. still kind of kid-friendly. It has a nice summer acoustic guitar vibe to yeah. it. A nice like accordion lead. It just feels very like, like you like to say, sitting on a porch with lemonade yes. kind of vibe to it. Yes, I really love the water driplet sound effects that's that's kind of being implemented in a percussion mm. feel to it. It kind of kept the beat. Yeah, it's like a light jaw harp or like, like yeah. water droplets somewhere yeah. in between those two. It was really cool. Was cool. And it makes sense with the style of the visuals, which were very similar to the previous games, like a hand-drawn art style. But some of the backgrounds and everything looks like oil paintings, like watercolors, crayons, like that, that sort of visual aspect and style. So yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. I remember reading about this game review-wise and was not impressed. It, it visually, from what I understand, despite all those colors, still looked very muddy, from what I understand. I didn't think that too much. No. I mean, well, they tried to use both paper on crayon style art design that they did with the original Yoshi's Island, but make it 3D. So it mm -hmm. did look a little, mm, didn't mesh very well. Right. You know, obviously with the 3DS, Nintendo always wants to show off the 3D mm -hmm. capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I think they implemented the 3D very well in terms of, you know, what's in the foreground, what's in the background, how it works within the game. But with the kind of paper-esque aspect to the textures and stuff, it felt like it should be more 2D. Right. You know, I didn't try turning down the 3D, 2D slider, but I think it probably might have looked better if I did that. But overall, I mean, the game was, it's not bad. And everybody that plays the game that doesn't like it will tell you it's not bad. It's just super mediocre. Mm. It's like no outstanding, like you've played the first three levels. Right. You've pretty much played, played the, the whole, whole game. game. You know, it, that's a shame because all the other games in the Yoshi series for like the Yoshi's Island experience, they all want you to go beyond the first three levels. Of course, they yeah. want you to beat the game, but you're still looking and like seeing new things throughout the entire game that are being introduced as the levels go on. And I think that they must have lost that as far as this game goes. But there's also a lot of vehicles in these games that you could transform into. And yeah. I know they continue that with this. You know, all sorts of stuff like helicopters and mine carts and submarines and all that type of stuff. So that all continues and carries through from the original Yoshi's Island games. Yeah. But, uh, you know, this is at the point where the Yoshi's Island series is getting kind of stale because, you know, if you played one, then you've played them all. Right. So I think with the sequel, with Yoshi's Island DS, they were like, all right, we're going to make a sequel, an appropriate sequel. And people were like, cool, we wanted a sequel. Awesome. Yeah. And then I think a lot of people played this one and they were like, all right, let's see something different. Yeah. You know, you know and, and I was just thinking they had all those different babies from from Yoshi's Story DS or Yoshi's Island DS. Yeah, it's too many babies. Too what many I was babies. what I was thinking of is that maybe you could use the babies like power-ups. So depending on <laughs> like throw the baby. <laughs> not throwing the baby necessarily, but you know, having the Donkey Kong baby would allow you to like swing from vines. Yeah. Or the princess would give you a bigger float jump like That'd she does cool. in Mario 2. That'd you be know awesome. that kind of stuff were taking characteristics of them as adults, but kind of transferring them to Yoshi no, as Nintendo they Nintendo needs to hire you. Million dollar idea I'm right there. I'm just saying. I'm just so, saying. Maybe when the 4DS comes out. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but, you know, the, but they didn't implement anything like that. So no. the gameplay kind of stayed the same aside from those vehicles and stuff. And those even continue on into the later Yoshi games too. But I picked Bandit Valley because a lot of the other songs on the soundtrack use this really annoying kazoo as the lead instrument. Oh, and yeah. And yeah. while not bad for a couple of tracks, having like the majority of the soundtrack and also coming through the more tinny 3DS speaker mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just got so grating after yeah. a while. You know, yeah. I ended up turning the volume down mm -hmm. halfway through my playthrough. But this one, I really like that accordion style. It was a much richer, deeper sounding song than most of the other ones. So this one kind of stood out to me. Cool. So Masayoshi Ishii, you know, we just talked about during the last break. I did dig up a little more information on him myself. He, he was commonly known as Chami when he did a lot of the tease music right. uh, soundtracks back in the day. Also Chami.ishi. Sometimes he's incorrectly referred to as Chami.ishikawa. I think that's mainly a Japanese kanji mistranslation. Right. He's best known for his work on the Sengoku Basara series. Uh, he started off in 1991 on the Genesis version of Outrun. Mm -hmm. And you pretty much went over a list of, you know, the other games that he's composed yep. over the years. So like Tempo on the 32X was one I think he didn't mention. He was music director on both Mario Party 9 and 10, which is kind of cool because those have great soundtracks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he was music director on Mario Party Star Rush. So cool. that's that. Word. All right, moving on to our next track. And this, speaking of tracks, this is from Mario Kart 8, the Yoshi Circuit track. 
track. This came out in 2014 on the Wii U. This was composed in part by Shiho Fuji, Atsuko Asahi, Ryu Nagamatsu, and Yasuaki Iwata. And that was Yoshi Circuit from Mario Kart 8, released on the Wii U in 2014, and uh, just in a little while on the Switch, too, as well. Yep. Composed by Shiho Fuji, Atsuko Asahi, Ryu Nagamatsu, and Yasuaki Iwata. Several very high profile Nintendo composers. Yeah. And I'll admit, okay, before everybody starts commenting on the Facebook group, I'm taking a little liberty with this track because originally this was the GameCube track for Mario Circuit, Luigi Circuit, and Yoshi Circuit, Mm -hmm. but then they rearranged it specifically for Mario Kart 8, and it's only on the Yoshi Circuit, so I I feel justified. (laughs) But it's a fantastic, it's one of my favorite songs from Mario Kart 8. Yeah, it's so it's high right. energy. Yeah. I love those horns, and then you've got that little like breakdown like three quarters of the way through, and then the bass groove comes in. Recording Definitely. with live instruments is just, it's like night and day. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it just sounds so crisp and clean. Nintendo put out, it was, an, it was either a Nintendo Direct or they just put out something on the web of these tracks being recorded live. You know, yeah. The guitarist playing the part and interviews yep. with some of the composers. and That was great to watch. And that mm-hmm. was before the game even came out. So right. we had the opportunity to check out some of the soundtrack before it even got released. Yeah, they did the same thing for Super Mario 3D World as well. They also had a full orchestra for like the Mario Galaxy game. Yep. So, and it just, it, it really is just so different to hear video game music with real instruments, but not like you know, your typical, like, licensed tracks where, you know, you'll play, like, Tony Hawk and you'll be hearing, like, band music, you know, from, like, a specific group or band or rapper or whatever. Here, you've got just fully instrumented tracks. And it's just, it's, it's fantastic sounding. Especially with a racing game, because then you got those real guitars and those real drums. It just sounds so much more fun and 
whimsical than yeah. it would if it were a computer making the music. Not that that's bad, but it just right. fit better, especially because Mario Kart 8 is, the graphics are so fun and fresh, and it just it just feels so playful. Very it feels visually, like, visually captivating. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a computer is generating the graphics. Right. It feels like a real life, you know, like a Pixar cartoon. Almost. Yes. So it really does fit very well. This is one of my favorite games on the Wii U. You know, it's good. I got, uh, Mario Kart to me is a dime a dozen. I spent a ton of time playing multiplayer with my brother on Mario Kart 64. Mm -hmm. I played a little of Super Mario Kart. All the other Mario Karts uh, I didn't really spend a lot of time with. I most lit The only reason why I buy Mario Kart games now is it's a good party game. So right. if I have friends over, like we can hang out and play some Mario Kart. It's a good game for people like, for example, my wife is not a gamer, really. I mean, she likes some games, but not a lot. Mostly yeah. like... Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, that type of stuff. But she loves Mario Kart. She especially loves Mario Kart on the Wii as well as on the Wii U, mm -hmm. where you could race with the wheel. She yeah. loves that. So, yeah, anything like that is, you know, I'll snatch that up just so, you know, I can play some video games with my yeah. wife. And she'll occasionally, like, come downstairs and kind of like, it's like one of those things where, you know, the basement door flies open and you know, hanging out in the basement, I'm just like, whoa, what's that light? What? And she's just like, you want to play Mario Kart? And I'm like, who are you? <laughs> so That's awesome. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, I think we, we've talked about this before, but when, when we get together and we all, you know, a bunch of us play games together, we play Smash Brothers, I'm like always the first one knocked out of the game. Yeah. But we play multiplayer Mario Kart 8, and I'm like, I'm lapping people, and it's like, I'm, it's not even fair. So mm -hmm. uh, we've got that kind of balance between, you know, you just get, you get Rosalina, you put her on a speed bike, you get fast wheels, you get good at her, and you're untouchable. Like, there's nobody else that's faster than yeah. her, so. You get good at Rosalina. You get good at Rosalina. And then no, you nobody can touch you? Nobody can touch me. Yeah. Especially yeah. Rosalina. Right. Yeah. Right. She, look, she looks nice on that bike from the back. So, yes. So, I don't know. Mario you know. Mario characters always look so weird to me. I don't really view them as, like, hot. Yeah. I don't know. You can't it's, see your face, so you can kind of imagine whatever you want. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> you know. No, I don't know. They just, like... It, you know what it probably is? It's just because in, in the back of my mind, uh, for whatever reason, anytime I look at Daisy on a speeder bike, all I hear in the back of my head is, Hey, I'm Daisy! Daisy! Hi, I'm Daisy! Yeah. From, from Mario Kart Double Dash. Yeah. Oh, boy. Ugh. So anyways, fantastic game. If you don't have it and you do have a Switch, go get it on the Switch because Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is going to have everything that the Wii U version had. Everything unlocked, all the DLC included, and plus more multiplayer uh, extra options and, and a really cool battle mode from what I understand too. So. I've been saying this for years. They just need to give up and do a Smash Brothers Kart thing. Adding more characters? No, like pretty much just make Smash Bros. Kart. Like instead of Mario Kart, do Smash Bros. Kart. So... Basically, you take Mario, Zelda, Link, Samus, yeah, so more characters Captain Falcon, yeah, but you put them all in different levels from all around the from all around the Nintendo universe, yeah. and you basically like make it Mario Kart, but make it Nintendo Kart. Yeah, I don't know if they want to dilute the property that much. It's a great idea. Oh, that'd be so cool. But it would it would be really awesome. They could make it super fast, like F Zero. Basically, just use yeah. the F Zero engine. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That'd be really the only way that they would be able to do a new F0 game. People like doing the drifting though and stuff, so yeah, yeah would maybe maybe two different styles of play would be maybe. cool. Yeah. Anyhow, let's talk a little bit about the composers. We've got uh, Shiho Fuji. She was a composer who started at Nintendo's Entertainment Analysis and Development in Kyoto in 2007. She worked mainly on titles in the Mario franchise. Uh, she worked on New Super Mario Bros. Wii uh, and, of course, Mario Kart 8. She also worked on Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword and Splatoon. And then she moved over to Nintendo's Entertainment Planning and Development Sound Group September of 2015. And she is rumored to have been the composer that worked on the mobile title Super Mario Run, but okay. we're not sure about that. Hmm. Uh, Atsuko Asahi, also uh, all these composers I think originally worked for uh, Nintendo EAD in Kyoto, uh, started as a sound director on Watashi no Ochobako in 2008, and then went on to work on Animal Crossing New Leaf, uh, Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD, and then Smash Brothers for Wii U and 3DS. Ryu Nagamatsu, again a uh, member of Nintendo EAD and transferred to EPD in September of 2015. Uh, his first release was Wii Play in 2006, and then worked on Mario Kart Wii, Wii Sports Resort, 
New Super Mario Brothers Wii, Mario Galaxy 2, Nintendo Land, uh, Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds, and Tank Troopers. He's like, I think, guess one of the lead composers because you see his yeah. name pop up all over the place. Yep, yep. Uh, he worked on Nintendo Land, I think, by himself, and there was so much music. Mm -hmm. So they really had him take the lead on uh, the flagship Wii U game. That so makes sense. I think he might have been the lead on this one as well. And then Yasuaki Iwata joined Nintendo in 2013 and then uh, moved over to uh, Entertainment and Planning Division with all four of these composers in 2015. Didn't do too much else. Uh, worked on some of the town and character themes on Zelda Breath of the Wild, including Gerudo Town, Goron City, and that really catchy flute melody that plays near the horse stables, which always gets stuck in my head, so I have him <laughs> to blame for that. But that's about it. So Iwata is probably kind of a new up-and-comer composer, and since he's working on Breath of the Wild, you'll probably hear more from him in the future. Most likely, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's roll into our final two tracks. These are from Yoshi's Woolly World. 2015 was year release on the Wii U, and this is Sponge Cave Spelunking. It's by Tomoya Tomita and Misaki Asada. That is so laid back. That was Sponge Cave Spelunking from Yoshi's Woolly World. Came out on the Wii U in 2015. Composed by Tomoya Tomita and Misaki Asada. Ah, oh, I love this track. I love this whole sound. Dude, I had to switch my picks up like five times before <laughs> coming to a conclusion because they're all so good. I just, I love this entire soundtrack from front to back. Yeah, no, it's really good. It, the game so far, I'm, I'm still in world one of the game. I, I got it fairly recently, actually within the past uh, few weeks as a late birthday gift. Finally sat down and started playing a little bit in between uh, my obsession with Gravity Rush right now. <laughs> and it is really good. It, it definitely gives me strong Yoshi's Island vibes, kind of brings me back to that era. It's a really difficult game, like for, if you're playing a normal difficulty, like it's it's gonna give you a challenge as a as a platformer, as an action platformer. It's, yeah, it's for good sure. stuff. Yeah. And it uses that same game mechanic with the, you know, moving reticle and you can, except you're throwing yarn balls now instead of of eggs. Yeah. You know, everything is made up of yarn. This is kind of like a spiritual sequel to Kirby's Epic Yarn, which came out on the Wii. Yep. That was much more of a 2D style game. This this one is obviously, it's still a 2D platformer, but mm -hmm. the, the graphics are three-dimensional now, polygonal. Yes. Um, even though they don't even look like polygons. Like, their, no. their yarn textures are fantastic. It is fantastic visually. I mean, it looks straight up like yarn. Like, yeah. actual real yarn. Not fake, not 2D fake. It just looks like you're standing on yarn. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's it's crazy. Yeah, and the ground sometimes looks like carpeting or crochet. Like, yeah. they do a whole bunch of different kinds of textures. Uh, it's it's created by Good Feel. They're the guys that also did Kirby's Epic Yarn. So they've kind of honed their yarn engine. I don't know what you <laughs> want to call it. But but yeah, this, this game is just a lot of fun. I normally probably wouldn't have given it too much attention. But uh, Logan, who just turned six, he started watching some YouTubers play it on his iPad. And uh, he got really into it. And I was like, all right, well, let's give it a try. So we started playing playing it. He had no idea what to do originally. And uh, we played it so much that now he's just going through levels by himself and clearing That's awesome. We have gotten all the way through. So you unlock 
once you beat the game, you unlock a boss tent, and it's basically boss rush mode. Right. And then you unlock the bronze, silver, and gold Yoshis by doing that. So we've got all the way up to gold, we've beaten all the bosses, and now he wants to get the platinum Yoshi, which you get by having 100% every single level, plus the bonus levels that unlock. So now we're kind of marching through the game, trying to get all that done. Hmm. Uh, he got really good really fast. So I got to figure out what platformer to introduce him to next, because now I've got a little gamer on my hands. Not like Eddie, who's the bro gamer. Shit. He can he can play on his computer all he wants, but uh, so Logan will be my console guy. But yeah, Kirby, it's just, Kirby it's just fun. Yarn. We did, we tried it a little bit. He wasn't as much into it. Okay. I don't think he likes holding the Wii remote so much. Okay. It's a little, you know, holding it sideways and that's all you do. It's a little more- Can't play that one hands. with the- uh... The pro controller, oh. can't do it unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I tried. Wow. So we'll keep looking. Baby, Bowser got pissed off because he didn't get invited to like a Yoshi's party or something like that. And Typical. He, he kidnapped all the Yoshis, and so well, Kamek did. So Kamek, Kamek shows up in the beginning. Kidnapped him for Baby Bowser. Right. right. So he shows up and he goes, Yoshi baby, <laughs> what's up? Yo, I'm, I'm stealing all your stealing all your friends. Yeah, he turned them all into yarn balls yep. and then kind of spread them out. Spread them out throughout the whole world. Yep. And so you and or a friend, which is nice because this is a two player game, which mm -hmm. I think might be the first for a side scroller uh, Yoshi game. I don't know if any of the other ones were two player. Mm, not that I can think no, of. No, not to my knowledge. But it's great for me because now maybe I can Yoshi's go through. Maybe Yoshi's Island DS. Maybe. maybe I don't know. But anyways, it was nice to be able to play a game, you know, with my kid. And I even got my wife into it. She doesn't really play that many games, mm -hmm. so that just tells you how much fun this game is. The yeah. whole family's kind of playing through it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so, and soundtrack is fantastic. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Tomoya Tomita. We'll, we'll play our next Yoshi Woolly World track and then talk about the other composer. Uh, Tomita, we've talked about him before. He started at Konami way back in 1998. I first heard his soundtrack, uh, TMNT3, The Manhattan Project. He yes. worked on that one. Yeah. Uh, Ganbari Goemon 2 and 3. Uh, worked on Dracula X for the SNES. Sound director for Castlevania 64 and Legacy of Darkness and Circle of the Moon. Uh, in 2005, he and a few other Konami members joined Goodfeel, which is made up of several former Konami developers from their Kobe branch. Right. And he worked on soundtracks to Wario Land Shake It, Kirby's Epic Yarn, and the 3DS Mii Plaza titles, Me Force, Battleground Z, Slot Car Rivals, and Market Crashers uh, while he was with Goodfeel. Uh, he announced that he was leaving Goodfeel earlier this year to go freelance, but said that if Goodfeel does put out more titles, that he would be open to working with them. And I hope he does, because it's just it's a really good fit. His, yeah. Like I said, this soundtrack was amazing, so I hope they, they do more with him. All right, so let's move into, and that's why I was talking before about sometimes they throw you a curveball with the soundtrack and you get something that doesn't sound like anything else that's in the Yoshi game. There's a lot of that in this soundtrack. Yeah, this is Lava Scarves and Red Hot Blargs from Yoshi's Woolly World from Tomoya Tomoya and Masaki Asada. Let's rock out.
the last track put you to sleep, this track, I'm sure, woke you back up again. Yeah. And that was Lava Scarves and Red Hot Blargs from Yoshi's Wildy World from the Wii U in 2015, composed again by Tomoya Tomita and Masaki Asada. And I guess I should also mention that uh, Kazumi Tutaka wrote the theme song right. for this game, but yes. only, only that one track, neither one of these two tracks. Uh, yeah, and totally rocking track. Uh, probably a, a callback to that original Yoshi's Island uh, boss theme. I think that played towards the end of the game, or is just just a rock. You, you said it was like you know Tim, Tim Fallen, Fallen prog rock. This kind of follows in that same kind Definitely. of vein. Definitely like a southern rock. I love the chromatics and then just the excellent drum work. It just sound like a authentic American Real rock set. song. Yeah, no, it's good stuff. You know, I will say I'm a little disappointed that you didn't pick the track that. I was totally grooving out to in this game, and we, we were talking about it uh, privately. It's called Amazing Post Pounding. Right, right. Uh, that is just a fantastic song. We'll have to save that for a, for a future episode. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's good stuff. Well, the whole Jazz soundtrack oriented. is full of like great bass solos. Tons and... of really like, full of variety, like, yeah. lots of variety in the soundtrack. So you're never going to hear the same thing over and over again. It's It's... T full of tons of variety, which you know most of the Yoshi's games have. There's right. a lot of variety in their soundtracks. So you get funk, you get Latin, you get big band, you get it's like swing, rock, swing, folk music, yeah, all sorts of cool all stuff. All good stuff. So the soundtrack's full of it. It's funny because Logan's Logan's played this more than I have because he's playing through it with Mila as well. Right. So we'll play a track. Like a like a music track in the car because I ripped it to, to play in the car as we're driving right. around. He's like he knows exactly which, which stages level? each of the that's each awesome. of the music is from. I'm like yes, a little VGM enthusiast. Yes. This is great. That's great. So I'm I'm really hoping this is one of his nostalgic games when he grows up. So mm -hmm. like you know when he grows up he he has this connection with with Yoshi in this right. game. Kind of the same um, way that you know we did. Yeah. As far as like the earlier exactly. Yoshi's games. Yeah. For his birthday we got him a Yoshi amiibo. The Yoshi Yarn amiibo. Actually I got that for his. Uh, report card because he got a good, good report card and we got Poochie for him for his birthday nice. and also a nice green uh, Yoshi t-shirt that he like ripped open and put on so he could wear it to school that day so <laughs> he was super thrilled about very it very cool so I'm sure he'll enjoy this episode of Pixel Tunes because it's all about his favorite dude so definitely so let's talk a little bit about Masaki Asada. She started working at Goodfield during the development of Yoshi's Woolly World, so she's pretty much a rookie at this. She also worked on the 3DS Mii Plaza titles Market Crashers and Slot Car Rivals with Tomoya Tomita, so maybe he brought her on and was kind of like, you know, showing you the ropes, this is how we do yeah. things here. Right, right. Uh, and so maybe now that Tomita's left, we'll start hearing more from her as lead composer because I think she's the only composer left at Goodfield at okay. this point, unless they've added somebody in. But, mm. but you know, uh, well, whichever songs that she did in, up composing for Wooly World. I'm sure they're, you know, every every track was amazing. So mm -hmm. I'm sure she's got some talent. So hopefully we'll we'll hear some more from her in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you never know. Tomoya Tomita could come back and work on games with her in sure. the future. Maybe a sequel to Yoshi's Wooly World. I'm I sure it's not complain. I'm sure it sold well. Uh, even though the Wii U is kind of not Nintendo's best-selling system. Uh, most of the Nintendo released games sold very well yeah, for well, Nintendo. And, and this was also re-released as Pucci in Yoshi's Woolly World right. on the 3DS, which means that it probably got enough attention on the Wii U for them to re-release. Essentially, it's the same game. Right. Uh, there's a few more Pucci oriented mini-games and stuff in it. Uh, and then you can also use the Pucci amiibo to unlock Pucci as a playable character. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure we'll probably end up seeing something in this vein, uh, maybe even not... Yoshi, but maybe in the same Yarn World kind of deal for uh, for the Switch as time goes on. And that is the last track of our show. So what would you say is your favorite Yoshi game that you've played? Uh, I'd say Yoshi's Island still. Yeah. You know, the original Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. Um, that one I just have a lot of nostalgic feels for. Mm -hmm. So I would say that. Though I will say I'm really digging this Woolly World game. It's a lot of fun. It makes me smile. Just wa like <laughs> visually just playing it. And I'm looking and seeing all the creative things that they did, like, you know, pulling on strings or pushing the fabric in to, like, access, like, the coins. And there's yeah. so much, like... Squish and fold and... Yeah, there's so much, like, hidden stuff throughout this game yeah. that it really brings me back to that, those moments playing Yoshi's Island where I, where I would get... It, it's not like Kirby where, like, I could blow through a Kirby game and collect everything pretty much until, like, the later levels. Right. But, like, this game, the very first level that I played with Woolly World, I thought I collected everything, beat the level, and it showed, like, I like I missed a, a flower. 
And I was like, where was that flower? Like, I was like, come on, tell me where that flower yeah, was. That's garbage. That so I was like, I was seriously getting mad at the, about the fact yeah. that I couldn't find the stuff. So I'm going back and like trying to blow through the levels quick so then I can go back again and collect the rest of the stuff. Right, find out what you missed. And it's yeah, nice yeah. because you, well, you, you collect gems and you can use those gems to buy... Uh, badges and so like yeah. one of the badges is that it will kind of like highlight secret areas or put little sparkles right. on them so it'll make it a little easier on your second run through to go back and find things right. that you might have missed the first time. I'm so. not using my gems though. I'm hoarding all my gems. Do it. Yes. You might need them in the future. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can you can activate Poochie mm -hmm. um, with a gem I think as you go through like the third or fourth world mm -hmm. and then uh, he can grab some stuff that I don't think Yoshi can normally reach so you do right. need him in a couple places. So. Yes. But anyways I mean, uh, absolutely recommended game. Yeah it's um, really fun. Unfortunately it's for a defunct system at this point but. <laughs> or totally you can get it on the 3DS. Or get the 3DS version. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And to answer my own question that I just asked you, yeah, I think Woolly World would be my favorite game, mostly just because now I have so much sentimental attachment to it, just by sure. playing it with my family. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I think it'll always be one of those games I look back on very fondly with Logan as a little kid playing, sitting on the couch with me. So Cool. Very cool. So what do we got coming up next on Pixel Tunes World? Next on Pixel Tunes Radio, we have episode 88, which is going to be fan favorites number three. So this three. is the third one that we've ever done. And it's actually going to be a co-host sort of thing where we're going to be working with video game music jukebox or VGMJB, as they're also known. So we'll have Emily and Josh on. Looking forward to chatting with them about video game music. For sure. We hope you guys got your submissions in because by the time this show came out, it's two days late. Too late. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. But I'm hoping that we have enough tracks to kind of, you know, showcase some awesome tunes from you guys. So um, we hope to do more of these in the future. They're, they're always fun to, to hear your guys' picks. But otherwise, check us out on pixeltunesradio.com where you can post comments about the episodes as well as pixeltunesradio at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach us where you can reach out, let us know what you think of the show, and also on iTunes. We are on iTunes as well as Stitcher and a couple of other uh, of the other like podcast oriented things. iTunes is probably the biggest, so if you like this show or you like the the entire thing, <laughs> this Pixel Tunes Radio thing, <laughs> uh, leave us a comment there and let us know. Like, give us a little mini review and let us know how we did. Exactly. And you can also join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Pixel Tunes Radio. You can find the post where this show has been posted and leave your comment and a like and a review there as well. And you can also post your own video game tracks that you love, talk with other fans of, of the show, and uh, a couple composers hang out there sometimes too, so yeah, chat with them definitely. as well. Also check us out on Twitter, at Pixeltunes Radio. That's our handle. And you can watch us, or listen to us, or both, on YouTube.com forward slash Dongold. And that is the, also the best way to watch Dude, You Haven't Played This Game, which is my video game re review show where I review video games. I'm just wrapping up currently with the next episode, which will definitely be released by this time, which is the Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. Also reviewed Ghost in the Shell for the PlayStation 1, and I'm moving on to some newer systems in the very near future. Excellent. Also, guys, don't forget about Retro World Expo. You can go to retroworldexpo.com. Tickets are now officially on sale. We will definitely be there. I know uh, Rob and Purnell from Rhythm and Pixels will definitely be there. Right. Uh, Emily from VGM Jukebox will definitely be there. We are still not confirmed to have a panel there yet, but even if we don't, we will be there and hanging out. Yes. So uh, come see us uh, and just go for the show because there's tons of awesome vendors. Lots of great stuff. We're going to have VGM cover bands, a cosplay contest, uh, an open free arcade full of all the best arcade games. It's it's such a blast and Special it's a great guests. time. Yeah, awesome. And lots of other cool panels, Definitely. too. I know uh, Dan Greenberg from Winter Ion Studios, they're going to be doing a panel there as well. Yep, yep. So we'll get to finally meet him. He's he's uh, requested a lot of uh tracks and asked a lot of pixel chat questions yes. of us as well so definitely cool to hang out with him very good so we will see you in two weeks for episode 88 fan favorites with our good friends video game music jukebox all right guys peace out